This morning, I want to take on the subject of unity, and I think it's a very important topic to think about, to pray about, uh, to look for in our lives is, is unity. And it should be no secret to anyone that we live in divided times, don't we? We live in a times where people are polarized, separated by what they think, by what they believe, by how they feel. And it's unparalleled in our country, at least in the last 50 years, it feels like, of the division. We have, we're divided politically, aren't we? And in fact, it seems like people of pol- political persuasion see each other not as brothers or sisters or even citizens, fellow citizens anymore, but as enemies, as villains, bad guys, bad girls, bad people. They're the bad, that, that's the bad folks over there. It was interesting that I, I read and, and saw that within our social media, that silos of information have been built. That people today now get their information where they think it will align with them politically and what they think ideologically. So I get my information from the place that aligns with everything that I think. So I'm never challenged to think any differently than what I think already. And that's a very dangerous place to be. They said in our social media that in fact they geared it algorithmically so that, that people would see the things that they agreed with because they're more likely to spend more time in social media if they see things that they already agree about. So they like and they share the things that they see over and over again, whether they're true or whether they're false. But because they align with themselves politically. And so what happens as a result is that our ideas and our prejudices We become further and further entrenched in them. And meanwhile, the truth seems to go unchecked. And then we have the divides of socioeconomics. Well, we're not divided socioeconomically. No, no, not too bad. I saw just this year... January 3rd, 2019, this speaks to the disparity in this town, in Nashville, that just within miles of neighborhoods, life expectancy goes up and down. Listen to this. South Nashville produced a life expectancy of 67.6 years, while the Severe Park Community Center in Melrose produced an estimated lifespan of 77.9 years. Ten years difference in only three miles in this city. Then you go over to... Two high schools five miles apart, the life expectancy for the neighborhood around Pearl Cone High School in Hadley Park is 69.8, while Hillsboro High School in Green Hills produced an estimated lifespan of 84.9 years, 15 years difference, and who's living longer? Now, I'm not going to get into all the reasons and ramifications that that's happening. I don't have time. But it does reveal that there is a disparity in Nashville. That there are divides in Nashville. Not only are we divided politically, socioeconomically, we divide ourselves racially. And people propagate a fear of races, people, a fear of people who are different, a fear xenophobia as it's called one person once said it like this racism is man's gravest threat to man because it's the maximum amount of hatred for the minimum amount of reason that you got the maximum amount of hatred and violence but you've got the least amount of thinking going on with it we're divided You think I'm going to leave out religiously we're divided? No, I'm not going to leave it out because I'm a preacher. 
But we're divided religiously, aren't we? World religions, denominations. And Jesus Himself even said that His teaching would divide people because there would be some people who would accept it, there would be some people who would reject it, and there would be some people who would just be indifferent to it. Jesus said that a man's foes shall be they of his own household because of his teaching. And there's also the idea in Scripture that we're engaged in a spiritual battle in life. That there is a spiritual warfare within ourselves and out and about. But the Bible says over and over again, we do not wrestle with flesh and blood. But our warfare is one of a spiritual nature. That our weapons are not carnal, but we're in a spiritual war. And even though there's differences, and even though there's these divisions... The answer has never been to hate or to propagate violence towards those people who are different than we are. Isn't that right? That Jesus said, you have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. And even though we are in a spiritual warfare and in a spiritual battle, God says never hate and never hurt. Paul said it like this, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of of God. You know, we're all in this together. Dr. King said it like this, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects another indirectly. So if you hurt someone in your neighborhood, it hurts someone clear across the country. If you withhold rights and if you hurt people, then you hurt everyone. And with all the division, the church represents that step closer to heavenly unity. That when I look out into this room today, I see people of different races. That I see people of different political persuasions. I hope you won't start talking about that right now. That I see people of different socioeconomic backgrounds, different educations, and so on. But yet we are in this room together serving God and worshiping God. That we have been brought together despite our differences. So the church represents that step forward to heavenly unity. And we know that there is a power in unity, isn't there? Just on a practical level, it doesn't go unnoticed, does it? That when there's a team that's functioning well together, when there are people in unified together, working together, things get accomplished, don't they? We see it. Aristotle once said it like this, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. That when we are together, when we are unified, we can accomplish so much, so much more than when we're divided. Makes you wonder why people are trying to divide us. Because if we were unified, where do you think the power would be? But there's a blessing also in unity. The psalmist of old, behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell in unity. It's a wonderful thing when you see a unified church. It's a wonderful thing when you see people unified together. And there's also a need for unity. Jesus prayed for unity in John chapter 17. He said, just as you, Father, and I are one, may they be one. Speaking of the church, speaking of you, speaking of me, that we may be one so that the world might believe. You see, there's a need for this church and for Christians to be united. Because the longer we stay divided, 
the more excuses that anybody has to not believe it. And Jesus says, just as God the Father and I are one, I want you to be one. I want you to be unified. So how do we achieve unity? Ephesians chapter 4 gives us this picture, this beautiful picture of unity and how to achieve unity. And the first way that we see unity, this godly unity, this spiritual unity, is that there has to be, first of all, an individual spiritual basis for it. That unity falls on the individual first. That it starts with you. It starts with me as an individual whether I'm going to have unity. And it says it like this in verse 1. I therefore the prisoner of the Lord. Paul is a prisoner at this time writing this letter. Beseech you, I beg you, listen to this. To have a walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. The way that we achieve unity is, first of all, understanding that I have a responsibility to God. That first, before I can have unity with anybody else, I have to be unified with God. I have to be unified with Him. And that's where it begins within ourselves. It begins in our character. It begins with integrity. And the best way that I can illustrate this for you today is, have you noticed... That the people who don't get along with people don't get along with anybody. There are some people who just don't get along with anybody, right? They're contentious. Because ultimately, they haven't took a step forward within themselves. That they don't have that inner character, that inner integrity that is required of us to walk unified with each other. And if someone doesn't have that integrity, that that character, then you can bet that there's going to be contentions, there's going to be disputes, and there's going to be problems, and there's going to be division because that's who they are. That's their modus operandi. So unity has to begin within ourselves. And listen to how he describes this. Verse 2, if you want to have unity, the first thing it says, with all lowliness. That it begins in humility. That if we're prideful, we're not going to have unity. If people are prideful, we're not going to achieve unity, are we? That it has to begin with unity. And over and over again in Scripture, God places this value in being humble. God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore before God, and He will lift you up. Humility is ultimately honesty with ourselves and who we are. And pride is deceit with ourselves. Pride is not true. It's artificial. If someone is prideful, if someone isn't humble, do they have the ability to accept counsel? No. But a humility, if you're humble, then you're able to accept counsel. You're able to accept another perspective. You're able to see another side. And isn't that the beginning of unity? Humility is also the ability to apologize. And if someone can't apologize, are they really pursuing unity? Because I don't have to go far in this room to tell you that I've messed up with certain people in this room. Don't look over there. (laughs) I've made mistakes. And as a result, I need to be humble and to be able to assess myself truthfully, not lie to myself and put myself in a prideful state and to say sometimes, I'm sorry. Humility also is the ability to serve and to help. Someone once said that if serving is below you, then leading is beyond you. If you can't serve, if you can't be humble, you'll never be worthy of leading anybody. Humility also comes when I see my life in light of Jesus. You know, sometimes when I go to music festivals, you go to these bluegrass festivals. And sometimes you go to these bluegrass festivals and there's these kid prodigies there. It's amazing. 
There's these kids that when they sit down with the guitar or the fiddle or the mandolin, they're like 14 years old, and they tear it up. And I play a little guitar, and I go home, and I go, wow, I'm humble. I say, you know what, I'll pa- you go ahead and play. But when I see my life morally in light of who Jesus is, in light of His forgiveness, in light of His integrity, in light of His life, then you know what happens to me? I become humble. Because I see my life in light of Jesus. It also says that the individual should seek gentleness. If someone isn't gentle or meek, And what that means is to be emotionally appropriate to the situation. That there's sometimes there needs to be an outcry. There needs to be anger. But it ultimately means that I'm appropriate in my anger. That's why the Scripture says be angry and sin not. But being meek and being gentle with my approach and who I am, that brings unity, doesn't it? Also, long-suffering, it says in verse 2. And long-suffering means patience and not to have a retaliatory spirit about myself. There's some people, if you mess up, if you offend them, or if you do something wrong, they're, they're plotting immediately to get back at you. But that's not patience, is it? That's not forgiveness. And when you have those type of people, it's hard to be unified, isn't it? That retaliatory spirit. One person once said, one minute of patience equals ten years of peace. That if I'm able to control myself, if I'm able to keep my mouth shut for just one minute, it might save me a lot of heartache. Long-suffering. And it says in the Scriptures that the long-suffering of God is salvation. That God waits on me. That God waits on you. It also says that we're to bear one another in love. That agape love in the Greek, which means unconditional. It means that I'm desiring to see the very best for you. That no matter what, I want you to do okay. That I want you to be all right. Your highest good. But it also says in verse 3, listen to this, endeavoring. And that word endeavoring is actually stronger than what we have it translated. It actually means to strive after it. That we have to strive to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. That we have to want it. And if you don't want unity, then you're not going to have it. That you've got to work for it. That it takes effort to achieve unity. And we have to strive for it, endeavoring and work at it. But it also says, so that's the individual basis for unity, that I have to begin to, first of all, look within myself and my character to get unity. And then number two, we have to share values together. There is a collective spiritual basis for unity. And listen to what he says, verse 4, there is one body. There's one church. And the body of Christ, the church is described as the body describes, first of all, the unity that we have with Christ. And that's an intimate thing, that we are so described as being His body. That's how close we are to Christ when we are a part of His church. How many of you are walking around without your bodies? None of us. I see head and body in this room today. And I'm glad of that. But in the same way, our connection with the Lord, He is the head of the church, the body. That one body, that one church. And we are unified with Him. It also shows that there is diversity among the members. Not everybody is the same thing in the body of Christ. We're not just one part of the body, are we? That would look rather odd if if we were just an eye. But we're not just an eye. We're eyes, we're ears, we're a face, we're a body, we're hands, we're feet. And it takes all of that diversity to make the body of Christ. And it says that every part does its share to cause growth in the body. It says also that one spirit, listen to this, one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. So there's one Holy Spirit 
that works in the midst of us. And that brings unity because there's one Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit works in two primary ways in our life. Number one, through the Word of God. The Spirit inspired the Word of God. So that's why we as a church turn to Scriptures for our authority because it is from the Holy Spirit. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Spirit of God, it says. And also we have that Holy Spirit working within us. It says that Holy Spirit produces joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Those are the kind of things that the Spirit produces. It also says that we have one hope. And that speaks to our common destiny as a people, that we have the same hope together, the same purpose, the same destination, if you will. We have the same expectation. We're going somewhere together. We have to be together. And it's unfolding and it's unrealized. And this is what Jesus said in John 14. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, he says. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, you may be also. One hope. And there's one Lord. That we all serve the same Lord. And that word Lord means as a servant unto a master. And it was the same term applied to the emperor. And it was also the same word that in the Greek Old Testament was applied to Yahweh. And it speaks of one Lord speaking of Jesus. Speaking to His authority and His preeminence. We serve one Lord. We have one faith. That we come to the Lord through faith. Believing. And faith is the substance of things hoped for, it says. The evidence of things not seen. It also says, one baptism. Some have likened baptism and they say words like an ordinance or a sacrament or a commandment. But what baptism is, is the most basic and initial response to the gospel message. That when we hear the gospel... We respond to it with faith and baptism. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And as a result of these ones, these seven ones, which ends with one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all, we achieve unity together. In conclusion... We are... Stronger, smarter, better, safer together, aren't we? And the whole is truly greater than the sum of its parts. And we should endeavor to be unified together. Number two, conflict's going to happen. It's going to happen in friendship. It's going to happen in marriage. It's going to happen in churches. It's going to happen in the neighborhood. But we should see conflict as an opportunity to show that we care. If you're in conflict, it's an opportunity to show what you care about. It's to bring clarity to the situation. And if we have that spiritual inner grace that's talked about in verses 1 and 3, of humility and love, then that conflict's going to go a little better, isn't it? And we also have to tune ourselves to the one. One way that it was illustrated was a musician, Brother A.W. A. Tozer, said that, have you noticed that if a piano is tuned to a tuning fork, to one tuning fork, then all of a sudden you have a hundred pianists tuned to each other. Because they all tune themselves to the one standard. And I remember when I was a musician and I went into the studio with a producer and we were, we were getting ready and we were these novice musician amateurs for a long time and, and we didn't use tuners. So we would get up there and tune to each other. And we were never really in tune. We sounded horrible. I'll say that. But we finally discovered tuners 
And that was electronic tuners. All you got to do is step on this pedal and it t- shows you how to tune your guitar. So all of a sudden we sounded twice as good than what we used to. But when we went into the studio with the producer, we all had our tuning pedals and we, hey, you need to tune up. We're recording. They're listening to everything. They're putting everything under the microscope. We want you to be in tune, boys. And our producer said, use the same tuner. What? They're electronic. He said, no, you're going to use the same tuner just in case, no matter what, that if you all tune to that same tuner, you're going to sound the same. And if we tune our lives to Jesus Christ, then all of a sudden you're going to find yourself in tune with somebody else. And it will be so in tune, you won't believe it. It'll sound like an orchestra that's tuned themselves to the same tuning for. We have to tune to Him, and then we're in tune with each other. And what a beautiful sound it is when we're unified, when we love each other, when we encourage each other, even despite our differences. May the Lord bless you this week, and remember to seek unity with those around you, and also to spread the good news about Jesus Because it's in that context that we receive a union with each other like no other. So today, if you're not a Christian, the Bible says to begin in faith. To begin in repentance, to confess Him, and to be immersed. And we become unified with Christ in such a way that we become unified in a church together. Or maybe you're a Christian this morning and you need prayers of encouragement, prayers of healing. If you need anything, know that this church stands with you to help you and to love you. So if you have any need, we're going to sing this next song to encourage you. So if you have any need, won't you come now as together we stand and as we sing.